let's see, today's tips. Uh, this is something I want to call the, the biggest mistakes that I see newbies make in, in a market that is going through a correction, right? So there are a lot of mistakes you can make in any market, uh, but the last, the only time, the time that you really don't want to make mistakes is when the market's going through a correction, uh, which we're seeing actively happen in the marketplace right now as a result of the rising interest rates uh, that we've been seeing since uh, uh, the beginning of this year, the beginning of 2022. So some of the biggest mistakes we see newbies make are number one, using the wrong comps. Um, how many of you guys, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm sure if you guys are looking at uh, uh, properties right now, if you're doing comps on those properties, my guess is you are using what has historically been the rule of thumb for us as real estate investors uh, when it comes to doing comps, which is what, what are some of the rules of thumbs that we use as real estate investors when we're, when we're looking at comps? Help me out here. That's incorrect, but what, what are some of the rules that we use to, to pull good comps? The area, and you said three month sales. Anybody else? It used to be six month sales. Now I would recommend not going probably more than two or three. Um, if you are using a comp, and the and and in the agent remarks it says something like multiple offers <laughs> best and final due by 5 p.m today what do you know about that comp it is absolutely no longer valid right so so this is a time uh and and <laughs> this is an unusual time in the market where i'm saying don't go back more than two or three months or go back a full year think about that even a full year ago we were multiple offers above list price right but it, the, we reached our fever pitch in this market in the may and june time frame so if you look at the average and median prices they were the highest in may and june since then they've, they've come down from that so i will just say please be careful when you're looking at comps now if you are um, dealing with a wholesaler what kind of comps can I guarantee they're going to give you? The wrong kind of comps. Yes, that's exactly correct. Uh, so these are going to be comps from probably six months ago when the market was at a, its fever pitch. So want to make sure you're not using the wrong comps. Want to make sure you're not overestimating the ARV. So ARV stands for after repair value. And I think the formula you were trying to say a few moments ago, uh, for us, we use a maximum allowable offer amount of 70% of ARV minus repairs. So it's the 70% that gets applied to times the ARV and then you subtract out the repair. So want to make sure you guys are using the formula correctly. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people use um, and, and can really hurt them in a market, especially a correcting market, uh, and this is for all newbies, again, whether the market's correcting or the market's even in good shape, is overestimating those repairs, uh, underestimate, I'm sorry, overestimating the ARV and underestimating the repairs. Um, so when there's something about a new investor, there's new investor logic or new investor math or new investor optimism when it comes to doing that remodel. It's like, oh, this is my first remodel, so of course everything's gonna go super easy. <laughs> and this is, this is the thought process, right? This is gonna be my first remodel. The city is gonna be so wonderful to work with. This is my first remodel. My contractor is just gonna take care of me like a little baby in his arms. You know, just to just make sure I'm safe and okay. And that contractor's not going to try and hurt me. No one hurt a little baby. No. They're going to take that baby. They're going to take the bath water. They're going to throw you out before they throw out the bath water. The and then they eat the baby. <laughs> wow. Cannibalism, too. That's new. All right. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, you, you must know some great, some great contractors there. Uh, so, so and, and then just overpaying in general. So, uh, and this, again, it can happen in every market, but it can really, really, really hurt you badly in a market that is correcting, which is the market that we're seeing right now. Uh, so some of the uh, biggest mistakes is not looking, not understanding or looking at uh, months of inventory. So most of you guys are familiar with this concept of days on market. Uh, most, uh, whether you're a new investor, whether you're an experienced investor, um, if you're just um, a regular retail buyer, the word uh, that's thrown, or thrown about often is this concept of days on market. So they'll tell you, well, the days on market for this neighborhood is, and they'll insert a number that is really, really low. So right now we're looking in the 30s, right? 
Um, but what they won't maybe tell you is something, another statistic that we use to measure the health of the market, which is called months of inventory. So months of inventory basically says if we stopped listing properties today, uh, based on the current number of, uh, based on the uh, buyer demand that we've had over the last 12 months, right? So we take that buyer demand over the last 12 months, we divide that by 12 to be able to get the average number of houses that are selling every month, right? You guys follow that? And then we would look at the total number of active listings and we take that total number of active listings and we divide that number by the average number of houses that are selling a month. So that gives you this concept of uh, and this number for months of inventory. Um, a healthy market is months of inventory about, or our six months average is a months of inventory about six months of inventory. Um, uh, um, in 2020, we were probably around two months of inventory. In 2021, in some markets like the Austin market, it was about uh, 0.6 months of inventory. Uh, so incredibly low. And uh, what that means is the market is, I don't want to say healthy, because people would say that might have been an unhealthy market. It was such a seller's market. So we were seeing multiple offers above list price, and in some cases, 20, 40, 50, 60 plus thousand dollars uh, above list price where these offers were coming in at. So um, right now we're at a, what, I was, what I would call probably a pretty healthy market. So our months of inventory is still low. It's below that six months. But when you look at months of inventory, it can get a little tricky. So when the market's going down, remember I s mentioned earlier, when the market's going down, it feels like you're, you're in an elevator, right? When the market's going up, it feels like you're on an escalator, kind of goes up a lot slower. So when the market's changing, months of inventory doesn't change as quickly because it's doing a 12 month look back. It'd be a little bit more effective if it did like a three to six month look back. The reason why it's typically a 12 month look back is because when you look at the distribution curve for sales, it's you want to take in the seasonality of the market in there, and that's why they do that 12-month look back. But when you look at uh, when the market's on the way down and it's taking the elevator down, you don't want to go back as far because the months of inventory number looks better than it is right now, and it's going to be the months of inventory number I'm going to show you based on how it's traditionally calculated. For you as a real estate investor, you need to be a little bit more savvy about this. Number one, understand the concept of months of inventory. So I'll give you an example of um, other markets where someone will, or a market that's going down, someone has approached me and said, Shinoa, I've got a property under contract at 70% of ARV minus repairs, right? What does that mean to me? That means this is a good deal. This means I'm going to make money off of this deal. This means I'm probably going to make about 15 to 18% of my ARV, depending on uh, how I'm funding that particular deal in terms of my profit. Now, uh, the thing that they won't tell you, and they'll even, they may tell you, well, in the average days on market for this neighborhood is 60 days. 60 days sounds good, right? It's gonna have my property sold in 60 days. Well, days on market is fantastic for the lucky ones that actually do what? Sell, make it to the closing line, right? And then you have all of the also rands, and the also rands don't always make it to the closing lines. In some cases, they expire, right, or get withdrawn off the market. So months of inventory really gives you more of an idea of what the competitive landscape looks like for you when you go out and put that property on the market. So there have been instances in prior market cycles where someone would bring me something that looked like a deal uh, just using two of the metrics. Number one, the purchase price is a percentage of ARV minus repairs. Number two, the days on market. But when I did further research and looked at the months of inventory, in some cases there were 30 or more months of inventory. What does that mean? You're going on a lot, you better pack a big bag you're going on a long trip. And that big bag that you pack and that trip that you're gonna go on is gonna be taking money out of your pocket every single month as you're sitting on the market. Because you might be holding that property for 30 months, which will basically wipe out all of the what? That'd be all the profit. That'd be all the profit. And that's even if you can afford to hold on to it long enough, depending on how you finance that, uh, that transaction. So you really need to understand not just the price that you're getting it at. You really need to n understand not just the days on market, but you really need to understand this concept of months of inventory. So don't re over rely on days on market. Also look at that months of inventory metric. It's really important when you are, um, when, when the market again is, is going down. And we typically see the months of inventory, um, they get hit the worst 
and you know when the market's going down, what what are the what are the major parts of the market segments that get hit the worst and get hit the hardest? Housing, yeah. Well, which 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 housing segment? Single family, okay. The high end. So if you look at the million dollar plus properties, that's where the months of inventory grow the fastest. And some of these high end properties might take you a year and a half to two years to build. So you're landing in a market that you you started that pro, pro, uh, project when the market was at its height. You're landing in a market when the market is not very healthy for a high-end builder. So it hits the high-end first and it hits the high-end the worst. The second place that it hits the market is where? The outlying areas. So uh, 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 the, the last to rise, typically the first to fall. So where the, uh, the inner city goes up first, so it's usually the last to fall. The outer parts of the market, right, are usually the last ones to go up. So this is when people start kind of fleeing out to that area. And many times, uh, those are also the first to fall. So just be aware of those market dynamics as you are um, as you are looking at your investment opportunities. And again, understanding the market cycle. So a typical market cycle is three to five years up, one to three years down, right? So again, it goes up at a at a slower rate, and it goes down at a very fast rate. So you're trying to you, you almost can't catch it, right? So you need to be in projects and in properties that you can be in and out of very quickly. Speed is key. Uh, and you have to have that capital to hold on. So what if you do find yourself in a position where you are, uh, when you started and you were looking at a project and you're like, oh, this is only 30 days on market. That's the average, right? And then you didn't realize that there were another 30 properties that were competing for that 30 days on market and you might be holding it for an extra long period of time. So you have to have the capital to be able to hold on to it. You know, we're in a, this funny situation where a lot of people, because of inflation, they'll say that cash is trash, some people have said cash is trash, but really cash is absolutely key when you're holding on to properties, right? And you need to make sure that you are able to uh, service the debt on those properties. You also wanna make sure you have to have a backup plan. So the people in the last market cycle that did not have a backup plan, Many of those ended up giving those properties back to the bank, giving those properties back to the lender, meaning foreclosure, short sale, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, well, not et cetera, those are really it, but not having a backup plan. So for me, what that backup plan looks like is if I have a property that I'm not gonna sell, what am I gonna now do to it, do with it? I'm gonna lease it, right? Because were we experiencing probably the best leasing market that we've ever had also, right? So as, a, as people have said, uh, I can't afford the mortgage payments anymore, now they're jumped into leasing and now all of the lease, uh, um, all of the, all the uh, landlords, they're finally able to raise those uh, monthly rents up, right? Uh, you also wanna make sure that you have a backup capital plan which m might look like bridge financing. What is bridge financing? What does that mean? It's closing the gap. So if you thought you were going to sell it, and now it turns out you cannot sell it, you may want to rent it for a year or two, and you need to be able to have that bridge financing to be able to do that. Bridge financing is typically about 18 months, and how long is a typical recession? It's less than two years. Typical recession is less than two years. So sometimes that bridge finance, is that bridge financing gonna be cheap? No, it's not. But is it gonna save you from a foreclosure or a short sale, right, or going bankrupt? And the answer is yes. So uh, understand that those options are there. And they bridge financing was something that we haven't really needed up until about three to four months ago. And now in some cases, depending on what your situation is, you might need a lot of it. So be sure to have that type of capital uh, lined up as well. Ah, um, so um, in the last market cycle, uh, and, 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 and when I say the last market cycle, I'm specifically talking about 2008, okay? Uh, and then even in this market cycle, so if I'll go back in the time machine to uh, May of 2022, in May of 2022, what was selling? That would be everything. That would be everything. Did it matter the quality of work? No, okay. When the market starts to go down, 
does that still apply? No. When the market starts to go down, the cream rises to the top and quality is everything. So I would highly recommend, so, so, and your contractors, by the way, where, where's their psychology? Where's their mindset? They're also six months ago, okay? Because why? Are they feeling any of the pinch right now? Are they feeling any of the pinch in terms of working with people right now? No, why? Because they're still finishing projects that were started maybe three months ago, six months ago, nine months ago, 12 months ago, or further. So who's, who's in charge in that relationship? The contractor is still in charge, right? And so as the contractor, they, they may, and I, I don't wanna make this a contractor bashing uh, party, uh, that's gonna be later, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, again, sometimes you'll see those situations where the, the shoddy work that was acceptable maybe six months ago is no longer acceptable today. So make sure that the work that you're, the product that you're putting out is a uh, top-notch product. Uh, and if you take too long to complete your project, uh, who are you giving your profits to? You're giving it to the bank, you're giving it to the county in terms of property taxes, right? You're giving it to insurance, you're giving it to utilities. Uh, basically, it's going everywhere but to you. And then um, something that I've been uh, talking about lately, and I know, how many of you guys are familiar with the phrase or the concept sandwich generation? Anybody in here, sandwich generation? So this is the generation of, um, of um, I, and I think it's a lot of Gen Xers and maybe in some cases a lot of baby boomers, right? What are, what are, what are some of the baby boomers right now uh, having to take care of? Parents? right? Gen Xers maybe taking care of parents. Who are they also taking care of? Kids. So that's where we get into this sandwich generation, right? We're taking care of the people that are a little bit older. There are our parents are taking care of our kids, right? So we're getting squeezed in the middle, right? So as real estate investors, all of us in this room right now are also part of what I will call the investor sandwich generation. What does that mean? We have sellers, who in their mindset are six months behind, yeah? We have buyers who in their mindset are six months ahead, right? You were exactly describing that situation. And then in the middle of that sandwich, so that's, not all the, that's not where the sandwich ends. In the middle of that sandwich, what else do we have? Contractors, <laughs> right, who are also six months behind. And then as a bonus, we get a you know, supply chain disruption, right, and inflation. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot in that sandwich that's putting pressure on us as real estate investors. You guys follow this sandwich generation um, analogy here? Thank you for uh, allowing me to pull that out of my hat. Uh, but uh, you have to uh, know that you are in the middle of this and you have to risk manage like you've never risk managed before, right? We do that every day. As soon as we wake up, as soon as we walk across the street, as soon as we get in our car, we're risk managing. But we have to risk manage at a much higher level as a real estate investor today because we're buying today and we're reselling into the future as we are in the elevator. Yes? Okay, so now the motivational part of this conversation is, and this presentation is officially over. That was funny, thank you guys, okay, okay. All right, so that was that, 